So 5.5 video two, here we go. Genetic modification. Do you guys worry about genetically modified crops? I mean, do you? Is that an issue that you're you know, cognizant of? Because about 20 years ago, it was kind of a big flashpoint. Um, you hear more about it, but it's kind of died down. Um, and uh, let's get into how it works. Um, here is um, an example of uh, now you see plasmids those are just little circles of DNA that are in bacteria so they basically use this restriction enzyme you know to cut the plasmid in just a certain way and they'll also um, take the foreign DNA this is from some other animal or uh, organism Make sure it has the same sticky ends. And then they'll take that DNA and stick it. See where that little opening was created? They'll stick this new DNA. So that part is the new DNA. And then you stick that plasmid back into this, you know, modified bacteria. It has this special plasmid. It has a special gene that you're hoping to, to deliver. And um, they'll put they'll insert that bacteria in the organism and if everything goes okay it will be able to insert itself um, into um, the host chromosome so you'll have to have that special plasmid enter the nucleus and then enter um, and establish itself within the chromosome so then they'll grow the plant in small cultures to make sure they're expressing that gene and then you have the modified um, plant so the, the most famous one would be glow-in-the-dark tobacco <laughs> because of the tobacco industry you know cigarettes tobacco has been studied a lot and they're used a lot for um, uh, as a test organism you know in the laboratory so they made these tobacco plants that could grow in the dark from uh, I think it was a jellyfish a, a jellyfish gene sticking into a plant so people freaked out like whoa <laughs> animal cell in a plant cell plant how can that happen well the way that DNA is read and pr uh, made into proteins is universal in the in the amino acids that are made uh, from the different you know combinations of letters are the same for the most part um, so that's why it can be done. Now this next part is the most famous, um, talk about somatic cells. So this would be, you know, taking a regular body cell and then making a clone. So this is the famous Dolly experiment, I think in 96 or 97. Uh, so you take differentiated cells, so just regular cells. I think it took it from the underside of Dolly's belly. Um, and basically, you take out um, the uh, nucleus from that um, differentiated cell uh, and you put it into an egg that's had its own nucleus removed. So kind of go back a little bit on this lower part of the diagram. This is an unfertilized egg cell, just regular, regular sheep egg unfertilized egg cell and then you bring in a needle and remove the nucleus nucleus removed remove that nucleus from the cell so now you have an egg cell with no nucleus but you're gonna add a nucleus from the organism that you want to clone so say it's say Dolly is awesome Dolly has the best wool around and weight way better than any other sheep so you want to make million like not millions <laughs> hundreds or thousands of dolly of dollies so you want to make a bunch of clones this is how you do it you get you would remove the egg from one cell remove the nucleus from any old cell that dolly has and then fuse them together and then grow that embryo usually in a petri dish see if it's going good oh yeah it's good I eat I can't remember I always mess that up and then you implant once it's going well well you implant um, the embryo 
into an actual sheep. It could be any sheep. So here you have three potential sheep involved. Sheep number one, sheep number two, and this could be sheep number three. And tons of problems with this. A bunch of these embryos were killed or didn't develop right. And I was hundreds. So that's why um, hu cloning humans is not practical because you'd have to really go through a lot of dead human embryos. And who knows? There's a lot of embryos that, that die now from uh, you know IVF that, that isn't you know um, carried out. You know eggs are fertilized and frozen, and sometimes couples use them, sometimes couples don't. All right, stem cutting. So um, what you need to do is you know think about variables that all need to stay the same and variable that you want to change. You know stem cutting, just take a plant, cut it in a certain way. You could vary the way you cut it or how long that cutting is. You could vary the type of soil, the amount of water, some chemical you add. But if you change one of those, one of those things, everything else needs to be the same. Um, and there's some plants that work better. So I want you to write that out. This is for you to write out using the help in your book, like it says on 197. And here we have monarch butterflies people worry about bt corn um, hurting monarch butterflies so this was a test the blue line is larva placed near bt corn fields and you have survival percent and larva placed in normal fields and you'll see they're pretty close but these um larva here with normal fields have a slightly higher um, survival rate now whether or not that's significant, we don't know. Because they are pretty similar. They're just off by the percent. That might be 21 and 19. Sir, my V's and U's look the same. You know that. So you see a slightly higher. So this provides some evidence that BT corn might be bad for butterflies. Might be harmful. But we need we need more data probably how many. This, we don't know how many um, larvae were test. Some evidence might be harmful. To uh, larva, I think that was butterfly larva, right? My memory serves. Uh, and this is how it goes. Um, you have that BT gene because they don't want, you know, their field to be eaten by these by any kind of larva. Um, and really, what they're worried about is not the. Um, the monarch but the European corn borer so they put the gene in the corn and then the boar eats the gene and oh this protein bad protein for its corn borer and then it kills it basically destroyed its gut from the inside dang that's harsh <laughs> but basically it's eating I th it think it's eating its normal food but it's actually eating a poison um, and then kills it that's some genetic modification. Now, if farmers always use some sort of, usually, unless it's completely organic, which is rare, some kind of chemical that controls pests. So if you don't do this, then you're probably gonna apply some other chemical. So what's gonna be worse? It's a trade-off. Um, like anything, especially in IV, we need to be aware of those trade-offs. There's never like a perfect answer to anything. All right. So go through the rest of yours. Um, I want you to fill this out, the benefits of GMOs. You got some potential harmful effects. And we've talked about PCR, ethics of um, all those things. And uh, there you have it, the videos um, for 3.5.